Hello and welcome. On the behalf of Indian Institute of Patent and Trademark, we would like to welcome John Van Van. She is partner at Comet Legal. Comet Legal is a intellectual property consulting firm which provides technical advisory in the case of patent litigation. About Wang Ma'am, she has long experience in hiring and recruiting of candidates. About her background, she is a mechanical engineer. She is already a mentor at Imperial College London. And now she is here with us to share her insights with our community that how to make an IP career successful in 2022. So she's going to talk about how you should prepare your CV, how to interact with recruiter, what are the most asked questions from a recruiter point of view. So let's get started and welcome back. Hey, hi everyone. Thank you so much for all the people who are here already. Um, so I'm Zishwan and I'm a partner at Comet. Um, I started Comet two years ago and just for background, I know Chester has just been really nice, but I actually finished university two and a half years ago and I worked very briefly in insurance and then just decided to move to India and start my own intellectual property consultancy, even though I didn't know anything about patents. Um, but in that time, I do do a lot of hiring and have done hiring in the past as well. And um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what we do as a firm, some problems I see, and how I think, you know, interview preparation, CV preparation, and, you know, just learning about soft skills can really push you ahead of the crowd. Um, so um, what my firm does is that we specialize in technical consultancy for patent litigations. So that's really focusing on helping legal teams understand the technology within patents. Um, you know, if you speak to any lawyer, what they struggle with is the complexities within a patent. So let's say you have an electronic patent. A lawyer who has never even seen electronics or engineering report has, just has no idea what is going on and we sit down and we sit down with those legal teams and say look this is what it means legally this is how it will impact your litigation these are your technical strengths and weaknesses and it really helps them understand how they should strategically approach their litigation um i am a mechanical engineer myself but what I personally have found is that I really love interacting with people. So um, doing business development, sales, marketing and hiring are really bits that I love because it means I can interact with more people and meet more people. So um, okay, I think there are some, I'm sorry, but I am going to repeat some of the things I discussed last time. So some of the things that I've seen specifically in India um, are that there are certain problems like there is just a lack of exposure to the roles outside of traditional patent, not patent, traditional IP prosecution and litigation roles. So every time you hear someone in IP, they all they seem to do is prosecution, filing trademarks, filing patents, filing copyright infringements, looking at litigation. Um, it could be infringement analysis and prior art searches. But actually, when you look outside of India, there are so many roles for IP professionals. You know, one of those roles is business development, which is what I do. And what, what that really is, is just um, working to expand the exposure of your firm, but also uh, try and get prospects to become your clients. So a lot of that is about networking and just telling people what you do and hope that they come and work with you one day. Um, other things are like, other things include things like marketing, like thought leadership, content creation. You know, there are IP professionals out there who just create content for businesses. Um, there's also a big um, education sector within IP. So I did my university at, in the UK. And, you know, even at a university level, whenever we were developing innovative things, they would tell us, look, you don't own your IP because you don't own it. Um, when it comes to... Um, the startup industry, there are also things like incubators, accelerators, and there are professionals there that helps small businesses understand their IP. So I was just saying there are, there are also roles such as um, technology companies producing IP. And there's a misconception that these are software developers who have just decided to produce an IP product. No, these are all IP professionals who then hire software developers to go develop, to create a um, company that services the IP industry. Um, you know, you can you can look these up, things like PatSnap. PatSnap is a really big firm um, that does patent analysis work. In India, we also have Vacuil Search. 
Um, and they're all built by IP professionals. And what I just want to bring awareness to is that there are so many roles out there, but the ones that are predominantly advertised are usually from law firms and they usually are prosecution and litigation. So what I also want to highlight um, to people who want to get into the IP industry is just in India, there definitely is a lack of equality to opportunity. So if you are already living in a city where the role is available or your family is better connected, you do get more opportunities. But um, one thing that I have seen lacking throughout the industry is just um, professionalism from whether that is you being interviewing, applying for roles to senior leaders who are interviewing you. But being professional and develop, developing soft skills, I think is a key way for you to stand out. Um, as a recruiter, I wish I could go look at 100 CVs and just hire the right person based on their technical skills. Um, because when you look at a job description, yes, it is asking you for um, the, the, the core hard skills that you're expecting. But when you get to the interview stage, you're really looking for soft skills. And soft skills are things that indicate how you work if you were to join that firm. So are you an effective communicator? Are you clear at articulating what you mean? Um, do you have attention to detail? Do you listen? Do you, do you hear people or do you actually really listen to them? And how are you going to integrate with the colleagues that already exist at a firm? And do you take on responsibility? Now, the way I like to say it is that from a recruiter's point of view, there are only certain interactions that you have with a person. So that would be them reviewing your CV, them looking at an email that you send them, them talking to you on an interview, if you get an interview. If you were to sum up all of that time, that amount of time could be less than 15 minutes, 20 minutes maximum. And in that 20 minutes, someone needs to decide whether or not you are going to be a good person to work at that firm. So you really have to convey that you are actually going to be a good person to work with, work there outside of the skills and experience that you have. Um, I, I absolutely think from my experience, at least, that the number one reason people don't secure roles is because they don't have soft skills. They don't know how to speak to other people. They don't know how to communicate what they're really trying to say. And those are actually core skills. So um, I'm going to start with um, CVs. Let's say there are 100 people applying for any one role. There is simply not enough time to sit down on each CV and look at it for 10 minutes. What we're looking at is not the best CV in the world. We're looking just for, do you have the basic skills? And do we think that you have enough experience for the role if the role is experience-based? And what actually stands out are mistakes, not what you're good at. It's also not the quantity of experience that you have, but how you convey that, what you have done. So for example, I see in a lot of CVs, someone has so much experience. Let's say they've, got three they've done three internships, relevant internships, but they will, in their, in their soft skills section, you know, additional skills, whatever you want to call it, they'll say, I have attention to detail. I'm really good at conveying information or something along those lines. But across their CV is dotted with grammar mistakes, punctuation mistakes, formatting errors. The font size is not consistent. A lot of times I don't even get people writing their own names correctly or emails correctly. And they, it's difficult because they do have the right experience. But if you cannot pay attention to the small details, it tells me that you actually do not possess the skills that you say you have. <laughs> because so many CVs will say, I have such great attention to detail. Then I say, then I'm thinking, you know, we've only asked you to make one CV to send to us and you can't even, you know, remove an extra space or put an extra full stop somewhere. And so these are all red flags. And that doesn't mean you won't get to an interview stage, but it just means that every interaction the recruiter is logging them. I, I actually log them in the spreadsheet. And I, I, I've written, you know, what is wrong with their CV? What is wrong with this? I'm not picking out whether or not you can do it because that's a minimum criteria. I've already checked that. I've checked it and then I'm checking your CV for other things. Um, and, you know, one key thing is really, are you, the recruiter's trying to work, work out whether or not you are actually adding value when you work somewhere. somewhere. So let's say you go do an internship at a law firm. 
the whole time are you actually doing something useful are you just sat in the corner you know this might not be your own fault because a lot of professionals aren't professional either maybe they don't give you the responsibility but if you spend one month just sitting in the corner of a room and you're not learning anything more then there was really no point you doing that internship because you haven't gained any more value even if you're able to put one more line on your cv saying that you work for a firm as a law student you can still do patents trademarks copyright one engineer alone cannot get a patent filed. You need someone to file it. You need to go someone up to argue it in court. There are so many roles. And I think that's what I'm trying to say earlier as well. Like there are so many different roles outside of just the patent analyst, the trademark filer, the copyright <laughs> infringement analyst. Um, so yeah, so just going back to, I guess, the recruitment cycle, um, you know, there's, the only thing most companies ask for you is your CV. Then you, there might be some back and forth if you get an uh, if you get an internship. So the recruiter will say, "Hey, like, when are you free? Can we schedule an interview? Whether that's an in person or online." What the other thing I always find is when people email me, there is such a discrepancy between their emailing style and their CV. So let's say you do actually have a perfect CV, or you're, you know, great experience, grammar perfect, punctuation, everything's perfect. And then the minute you start writing your email, you're writing, you know, you all, I always almost feel like people are writing emails to me like I'm their friend. They're like, hello, ma'am, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> and then they're, they're telling me a lot of things about them. But, you know, we're just trying to get to the point of organizing an interview. But again, the email is dotted with grammar errors, spelling errors. And this is not appropriate because I'm not saying it's actually inappropriate. I'm saying it's not representative of who you've already shown me to be. If your CV is perfect, then you write like this, then you are not this person that your CV is telling me that you are. And again, I log that. I log how is your emailing style. Then we get to the interview. If you get to the interview, you know, I, I again, am still looking for whether or not you are who you truly say you are. So um, if you say on your CV, I've got excellent communication skills. And then you speak to me and you don't have that skill. I'm like, okay, so they don't have the skill. And it's not a problem if you don't have that skill, but you can't, there's only so much you can embellish your skills. On your CV, you obviously have to boast. But if someone is going to question you on that, which they might, you have to be able to back up that you actually have that skill or experience. And if you can't do it, then it shouldn't really be on your CV. Um, and like, again, I, like I said, in the 15 minutes or 30 minutes, however long your interview is, that person is deciding whether or not to give you a job. So you really have to prove that you are a good candidate and a good person that they want to work with. A lot of it is about likability because there are so many people with skills, but I'm trying to work out, can I actually work with you? Um, and, you know, I would really treat every interaction you have with an interviewer as a test. So for me, you know, one of the things that I do at least is I always say, when I, when I offer an interview, I say, hey, could you reply to me confirming that you still meet these three basic requirements? Usually they're just like available immediately or have a certain degree or, um, yeah, I think it's usually the, just those two. But the number of times that people don't email me back that is, that is a warning sign to me. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, have you not read my email or you don't care? <laughs> um, and if someone doesn't meet those requirements, are you transparent with me with your answer? If you don't, if I ask those two questions and then you answer me something else, then I'm like, oh, maybe they didn't understand my email, which is unlikely. Or two, they don't want to tell me that they don't meet these requirements. And that is also a red flag to me. <laughs> If you tell me, hey, look, I still don't meet these requirements, but I would still love to work with you. I'd be like, hey, this is awesome. Thank you for being clear with me. I will still continue to consider you. But if you tell me something completely else, I'm, I'm like, okay, maybe they're hiding something. <laughs> you know, these are all indications of how you're going to work. And it's not about just saying, you know, being a yes man and saying, yes, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. <laughs> um, uh, okay, yes. Um, the other thing that lets people down is um, people don't do even the basic research into the firm that they're applying to. Look, we all know everyone's applying for maybe 50, 100 terms, firms, however many you want to apply for. But if you get to an interview stage and you don't even know what the firm does, 
that is not a good sign. Um, a lot of the times I actually find people, you know, make up facts about my firm. <laughs> They'll be like, oh, you've been established for so long. You're such a um, long standing firm and you've got such a good reputation. I'm like, where have you read this? Like, <laughs> we, this is not true. And then tell me, oh, we have, you have offices in different places. Anyway, you know, it just do your basic research as to what they do. And if you know the interviewer, go look them up on LinkedIn and find out who they are. Um, as much as an interview is for you to get a job, it's actually for you to find out whether you want to work for that company. Like I said, um, if, if the interviewer, uh, but earlier I said that um, people are not professional throughout the industry. And I mean that even to you know, the senior level where you, where you might have a partner interviewing you who still cannot turn up on time or doesn't even sound interested when they come and interview you. It's for you to decide whether or not you want to work for that person as well. It's not just them saying, oh, um, would you like to work for me? Um, and yes, it's definitely a two-way conversation um, between you and the other person. Yeah, go, just going back to um, basic research as well. Um, so many times I, I, I will interview someone and I say, hey, you know, do you know what we do as a business? And all I really want them to say is, oh, you're a consulting firm. But then they start telling me about how they've always wanted to work at a law firm. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> then maybe you don't really want to work for us. And it just really basic things like that. I'm really not expecting you to tell me, you know, what year we were founded, how many employees we have, you know, not that information, just a genuine reason why you want to work there. Um, it could just be as simple as, oh, look, I, I just came across your job on LinkedIn and it looked really interesting. That is enough for me. But you know, don't make up facts along the way. <laughs> um, the other thing is don't rush to answer your questions. So I think there's a bit of pressure in an interview. Maybe you're a bit stressed as well, but don't, don't rush to answer the question that you don't know the answer to um, just because you think you have to answer. So um, a lot of the times people just don't spend, you know, half a, half a minute thinking about what the answer is. So, okay, for example, we typically hire um, people with electronics backgrounds just based on the projects that we have. And I always say, hey, um, you know, do you have a um, working, uh, have you done, what, are you, what is your experience in electronics engineering? And they'll say, oh, yes, I definitely have it. And I say, okay, so what is it? And then they'll say, oh, I, you know, I just did it at university. And then I'm trying to ask, you know, to clarify what exactly, what courses they have done, what technologies they have seen. But because they're so keen to please the interviewer, they'll just say, yes, I can do it. I have done it before, don't worry. But if you actually don't have the skill and you tell me you can do it, but then later say you can't do it, it's, you know, it's much better just to say, hey, look, I haven't really looked at it, but it's something I'm interested in. And just being clear with the interviewer, because again, you're, I'm trying to work out whether or not you fit into the firm, whether you can actually do the job in that short 10, 15 minutes that I speak to you. Um, yes, and um, the other thing is, when it comes to online and in-person interviews, I think a lot of people don't treat online interviews as real as a real interview. If you even turn up one minute late, five minutes late, it makes me question whether or not you can turn up to an in-person job on time. If you can't even turn up one minute earlier on an online call, and if you do turn up on time, are you still faffing around? Are you still like, oh, like closing your blinds or like, you know, like turning on your camera, like, oh, your mic's not working, or let me try and get it on my phone. You know, those things you should be ready with. And it is sad to say, because I feel like a lot of professionals who will be interviewing you might not be professional either. And so maybe they're turning up late. So you just think, oh, well, I might as well turn up late. No, the other person is the person you want something from, right? Usually a job. So you, their time is way more valuable than yours. So even if you have to wait half an hour for someone who is not professional to turn up to a call to interview you, you need to be ready the minute that they are so that, that you are not wasting their time. Um, and, um, you know, at the end of the interview, people also always ask, um, the interviewer will usually ask, hey, do you have any questions? This is your time to not only ask questions um, for yourself and find out if this is the right place for you to work, but also, you know, find out more about the role and demonstrate that you actually have a genuine interest in the company. 
a lot of the questions I get asked at the end of an interview when I say, hey, do you have any questions? They go, oh, so what are the working hours and what is the pay? You can absolutely ask that. You, and you should, because you should have that clarity. But it's an opportunity for me, me to realize whether or not you genuinely care about the role. The relevant questions are really, what does my job entail? What will I be working on? Why do you like your job? <laughs> Why are you working here? How long have you been here? What is your favorite part? What are the worst parts of your job? You need to work out whether this is somewhere you actually want to work. If in that 15 minutes you don't care to ask, then you don't care about the job. <laughs> You're just willing to work anywhere, which is also fine. But you, you do need to some level of interest for the recruiter to know that you actually want this role. Because you can't, if someone's interviewing 100 people, that if 20 people say they're not, you know, don't ask any questions, don't seem interested, they've already gone. You know, they've gone out of the recruiter's mind. They don't care about them. <laughs> But the people who are genuinely interested, you're like, oh, look, this person seems to have a gen seems to be seems to have a genuine interest, whether or not that is real or not. So just do that extra little little bit of preparation, um, and it really doesn't take long to research the basics of a company. Or you know, just go go, go on Google, find out what questions you should ask at the end of an interview. <laughs> just go ask those, and that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah. So um, I want to talk about uh, senior leaders again. Um, I've definitely seen in India that, you know, senior leaders are not professional as well. And typically um, people who run the firm do their own recruitment. So same as I. So we wouldn't get a recruitment company to do it um, because I do think IP is quite a specialized industry. Um, so, you know, especially for my firm, I would need essentially a patent recruiter <laughs> to help me find the right person, which is quite hard. Um, so when you're starting out, the most important thing is getting experience, not just the brand. I think a lot of people say, well, I want to go work at this really renowned company, which is fine if they are able to op offer you the ability to learn. But again, if you go do an internship and you don't learn anything from it, there is absolutely no point of you doing that internship. <laughs> you might as well have left it blank on your CV. Um, yes, and you know, find really just find ways to get more opportunities to learn more things and I think it's I, I'm not very good at giving examples of how to do it but even amongst your own network you know even part of IPTA go ask someone if they got a job oh you know what was your interview like um what what does your job actually entail um LinkedIn is obviously a really amazing place and it's somewhere where you can go connect with loads and loads of IP professionals. I think it's very underutilized in India and people don't really use it properly because people are just sort of sending out connections, but there's, you know, being connected doesn't mean anything. And um, what is the point of being connected? You probably want something from them or they want something from you, but it's both ways. So go look outside of India, you know, everyone from the internet, you say, you can go find an IP professional, go follow them and say, oh, look, I'm really interested in what you do. Um, can I learn more? Um, maybe they'll tell you, maybe you could just follow them. Um, and again, go to things like um, webinars, talks, um, and just really look at how, you know, what are the key skills you want to, you need to develop for the role you're interested in. So for example, let's say you want to go be a trademark litigator or a patent litigator. Um, if you go onto Google and search, what are the skills you need? It will not say you will need a law degree, even though you need a law degree, it will say, you need communication skills, writing skills. You need to be able to work with people. You need to be a good team player. You need to be timely. And then think about how you're going to develop those specific skills. As an AI Right? Yes. Okay. So, and um, I think um, there are still lots and lots of ways to do that for free, especially if you're at university um, without, without having to, um, you know, pay for anything to do it. So for example, at university, you can try and you know, join societies whenever there's a talk, whenever you have to give a talk, go actually do it properly. I think a lot of people, when you are asked to do a talk, you're like, oh God, like I have to go do a talk, but use it as an opportunity to learn. Um, one of the things I did um, when I was a student was I, I was really into entrepreneurship. So I just started my own you know, YouTube channel. No one really watched it, which is fine. But all I said, all I did was I, I said, I want to go interview entrepreneurs. And the reason I wanted to do it was because I wanted to be able to network, which I didn't really know how to do at the time. 
and also learn from entrepreneurs. So it was really a self-serving role, but that really allowed me to go create my own network and develop the skills and also have something to put on my CV. And I think, you know, there's little ways you can do that as well, you know, and I really think all industries are very people based. So it's about, it is about who you know. And so, you know, the question is, how do you meet more people? How do you get more information? Um, I don't really know how to answer that because there are so many ways to do it, but it's really the soft skills that you have to develop. And um, I think the only other thing I really want to say is just um, keep practicing. So if the skill is communication, keep finding ways to practice it. Even if you're practicing it at home, you know, every time someone does a talk, even this talk today, you know, I practiced it maybe four or five times already. But for an interview, people go in and they haven't even thought once about why they want the role. They've not even asked the questions themselves. So they're really thinking on the spot, <laughs> which is really a really hard task, a really hard thing to do. Not many people can do that. Um, and I know I'm jumping out about a little bit. Um, the other thing is, when you read a job description, I always find there is a bunch of people who don't apply for roles because they don't think they meet 100% of the criteria. Just go for them. Read between the lines and find out what they're actually asking of you. So um, even in our job descriptions, we always write, well, you know, we need um, someone who ha has an engineering or a science degree. What we're really trying to say is we need someone who with an analytical skill plus some working experience in electronics. So if the role is science plus engineering with working knowledge of electronics, that doesn't mean you actually have had to go to university. It means even if you have just finished school and you have worked with electronics before, that would be enough. But I think people always think, oh, well, I've not met this one criteria, so I shouldn't apply, even though I do actually have the skill. So if you have the skill, just go for it because no one is ever going to match 100% of what a recruiter wants. And it's better to just apply, get rejected, than not try at all because you actually don't know what people are looking for. Um, so when I say, you know, for our role, yes, we want someone with an engineering or science background with working knowledge of electronics. That might be criteria for us, but for someone else, it might be completely different. And you can't assume based on what you've read on the internet. So just, you know, just keep applying. Um, yeah, just keep applying, keep practicing. <laughs> awesome, awesome. That, that is such a great insight students you are getting because ma'am has such a long experience. She has uh, interviewed so many students. So this is, this is all coming from her experience. And please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Ma'am, can I ask some questions which are there in chat? Yes, please. please okay, uh, Garun has asked a question. Uh, hello, ma'am. I want to uh, ask that how to create statement of purpose that uh, and if possible uh, a demo of how i can create a statement of purpose maybe he wants to ask it uh, like, like a lot of interviewers ask question that why do you want to take this job like, this is a statement of purpose so how do they should how they should answer that question okay so when i when you say statement of purpose i think there are two um times that this appears so one it could be in your cv a lot of people will write well i want to go work for an ipr firm blah, 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 blah. And the second time is during the interview. So how, how do you create a statement of purpose? I think you have to try and find a genuine reason that you want to go work somewhere. A generic reason like a firm's reputation or the number of employees that they've had, they have or the size of the company is not really reason enough because it's so generic that it applies to everyone. A lot of the times I actually see people writing the wrong company when they write their statement of purpose. So they're like, oh, I want to go work at this company, but they're applying to our firm. And I'm like, oh, well, this is not, <laughs> this is not that firm. Um, how do I answer this? How, how, how do you create it? I think it doesn't matter too much what you write, as long as it's in line with the company you're applying for. So um, because you've got to keep your CV generic for X number of firms you're applying to, a lot of the times I'll say, I'll see, CVs and say, hey, I want, you know, I, I really want to work at a law firm. And, you know, for me, we're not a law firm. And so when I see that and it doesn't align with what we do, then I think, okay, well, this person doesn't actually really want to work here. <laughs> or maybe they've not checked it prior. Um, so I would either just make sure that it works for who, wherever you're applying to or just not have it. 
So this is a very important point, audience. Ma'am is trying to make. Ma'am is saying if you, if she is talking about her experience, her company is a consulting firm, not a law firm. So when you're applying to a company, don't say I want to work for a law firm because I'm say okay, we are not a law firm, then we are not the good match here. Yes. Yes, yeah. that's <laughs> so very long-winded. Sorry. <laughs> and one, one more question we have from yeah. Ashwarya. She is asking, "What is the role of a patent analyst inside uh, a company?" Um, it really, really varies. Um, so a patent. Okay, I'll explain what it is, what it means for us. For us, it is critically analyzing the technology within a patent for its technical strengths and weaknesses. Um, pending a litigation. So how does the technology relate to what the damages can be claimed on a litigation? Um, an analyst can do a variety of things though. So there are certain um, things that a patent analyst do, can do, things like read and to operate searches, um, claim mappings, um, uh, prior R searches. Those are like specific tasks, but you know, the term is quite general. It, it really just means analyzing a patent. So what, whatever that is used for. Awesome, awesome. So my mistake, so patent analyst role is to analyze a patent, which can be used for different use cases, depending on what situation it is actually. Yeah. And, you know, as a recruiter, um, it really is our job to keep the role as broadly named as possible, because we really want whoever we hire to be able to do a variety of tasks. We don't want to just hire someone who's only does, let's say, prior art searches that is not good for us as a company so a lot of these times these job titles are very generic mm. right this is an awesome insight that ma'am is trying to make that companies like comic legal is always looking for people who is multitasker who can do some things and contribute to the company we have one one more question yeah. from rashi what question can we expect in interview regarding ip if you can give some sample questions which she can prepare generally i think they're quite broad so often I just ask um you know what 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 interests you about IP um what IP technologies have you seen for a pattern role maybe it's like have you seen an interesting pattern in the IP space if it's for a trademark role you know have um what interesting trademark cases have you seen again these questions are not specific to IP it's just to find out whether or not you have a genuine interest in the industry because a lot of the times people don't they they just they they come for the interview almost pretending like they are so interested in IP, but then can't don't have a single reason why. So I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, one more question from Rohit Ashok, uh, ma'am. If we find any recruiter or a company on LinkedIn, how we should connect to them on LinkedIn, even when they have not posted the job. Yeah. I think in India it's especially different difficult because. Recruiters are also not very professional. They will not get back to you. Um, I, I've heard from so many people, they'll apply for a job and they never get a response back. Um, what I would actually do is follow the companies, follow, you know, let's say the senior leaders within the companies, send them invites, but don't say, hey, look, I want to connect with you because I want to work with you and I want a job from you in the future. <laughs> you know, you can write something like, hey, I saw you wrote this really interesting article and I would love to learn more about you or learn more about your firm. Because anyone who is in a senior leadership role is not going to accept your invite if you just, one, don't send them anything. Two, you just want something from them. LinkedIn is it is a two-way relationship. So either you are you are just there to follow them and you want to, to see how what they're doing. It's very hard to stay updated with posts um, about firms because in India, you know how people post job job opportunities. They will write one post and they'll be like, everyone come for an interview on this time. We'll send the invite like five minutes before <laughs> the interview. It's not a professional setting so it's very hard and also don't you know don't limit yourself to um roles within india especially now with covid you know i've seen a lot of indian people go work internationally where people will treat you with more value a lot of the times um so sorry just to go back to the question how do you connect with them i would always send someone a message i would always find a reason as to why you want to connect with them either you saw them at a webinar or um you it could just be i i just came across your profile by accident and it's really interesting i would just love to learn more by staying connected with you or you've written something or i saw you commented something find a reason to talk to them and you know make it feel make them feel like they want to connect with you 
Um, but in terms of keeping updated on jobs, constantly pestering them, being like, is there a job available? Then they, they don't care, honestly. <laughs> And it really is up to the interviewee to just try and stay updated with what jobs there are. And more professional firms will advertise their roles on their actual website rather than just some you know, rogue LinkedIn post about what jobs there are. Awesome, awesome. That's, that's a great thing. One more question we have is, um, ma'am, I want to make a very eye-catching CV. So should we apply watermark on our CV to make an attractive or innovative like science diagram or chemical bonding as watermark or can we make colorful page? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I personally think that you cannot stand out alone on your CV because it's always still so important to get to that interview stage for someone to speak to you and find out who you're really like. Again, like I said, I wish I could just hire people based on their CV, but I can't because it's really about that soft skills that they're showing me during their CV. And on the other side, I think some people think that you know, a very colorful CV is very um, non-professional. So let's, let's talk about law firms for a second. You know, a lot of senior partners at law firms are much older <laughs> and them looking at a very colorful page they're like oh what is this like this is not a piece of artwork you know that is the kind of stuff that they will say so I think it's very difficult to say whether or not you can stand out I'm not saying if, if you sent me that I'd be like oh wow like <laughs> I, I will remember the CV but it's not going to make me remember you because as long as it, it is error free I will speak to you and then I will judge you properly but on a, on a CV alone, I think it's very hard. I think a CV is much more about just consistency. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. There's one more question from Ashwarya, which, the, which she's asking you a personal question. Ma'am, how do you find this fee? Is this a monotonous one? I personally do not. Um, I think it's, sorry, how do I find this fee? I don't find it a monotonous one. It is a very interesting um, industry because there are such a variety of roles. And again, People don't know that these roles exist. And so it is up to the person who is looking for a job to go find out all the things. Just go have a Google, what jobs are there in IP? I personally do business development, which I absolutely love because I get to talk to people all the time. <laughs> so whether, you know, really half my week is just either on LinkedIn or going to conferences, going to webinars, going to interactive sessions, meeting new people, and then just talking to them and developing a professional relationship with them so that one day we can work together. One day, maybe I need something from them, vice versa. And I just find, I find it very exciting, even though I'm not someone who focuses on the patterns. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll take one more question from Vijay. Usually there's a bias when it comes hiring of legal and non-legal candidate. How to overcome that point of view? I think that really depends on the type of company and what they're looking for. So for us, we absolutely do not bias. We do, we do, there is no bias towards a legal candidate. <laughs> um, but it depends, again, on the role. If your role is... Um, if, you're, if the role is very legally orientated, then yes, having a legal background is recommended. If let's say you are, um, you didn't do a law degree, but you still want to get into a, you know, a, a role which involves some legal thinking, you need to develop those skills to, to show me that you are capable of doing it. Um, yeah, it, it's difficult to answer because I, I do think there, you know, there can be biases, but, um, yeah, it's just really up to you to try and find find out where you want to fit in and hope that they that fits into the, what the company needs as well. Okay, ma'am, uh, do you have time? So we'll take one more question. One yeah. last question. I'm very open. I, I can go for as long as you like. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, there's a question from Monica. She's asking, is there a need to qualify the exam to work in a particular country? Uh, what experience uh, they should get if they want to work internationally as a into patent industry or something yeah um so i'm just going to read it so yeah. you're already asking uh, uh there's other qualifications that you might need to work internationally right yeah um so i definitely think that's true um especially if you're a lawyer and you want to do ip cases you are jurisdiction bound based on your degree um for you know at my firm at least we're not bound by jurisdiction because of the type of work we do, you know, um, if we can understand a mechanical pattern, we'll, we'll do it for any firm across the world. 
Um, yeah, I do think that there are restrictions sometimes, but with remote roles, I definitely think people, it's much, it's much easier than it's ever been before. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to read the second half. So for SAC patent analysts, do I need to clear any exams to work in the other country for the role? What skills and experience do you need? Um, so yeah, I, I think there are other qualifications. So for example, some people would expect people to be patent analysts, which is an exam you can take. Um, at my firm, it's not a requirement because <laughs> it's just not needed, but we still require the same analytical skills, which I've talked about before as well. Um, I think you just, I know this is not a good answer, but you will just have to look at what those restrictions are. Um, yeah. So uh, ma'am is saying that there are different job roles in like uh, comic legal, this is more of a consulting firm. So uh, jurisdiction is not that important. So it depends upon, the, so more they requires analytical uh, skills, how you analyze the patent. And then, uh, yes, if you want to work into maybe litigation, then your law degree definitely matters that in which jurisdiction you have a, a license for practice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. So it was a great session, Bang Bam. And it was, so, it is, I'm so happy that we are getting a very good response. We have like almost 42 people live who attended this session. And thank you so much for giving your valuable time. I, I understand that you're very busy with your work and you have taken up time to interact with our community. And we at IAPT are really looking forward to work more with you in future where we can maybe sit together have some mini course developed with you so that yeah. we can take up each aspect of it like cv in one aspect LinkedIn yes. networking as one aspect or how to answer question in one aspect and you can be a mentor on our board and students yeah. are also saying a very are getting a very um like giving a very good response uh, so i am receiving a lot of thank you so <laughs> i'll convey to you thank Everyone. you yeah yeah so, um, um and i will just say that you know um, what I've expressed today is very limited to my personal experience and it does not represent, you know, the other firms um, which hire for IP roles. Um, also, I will put my email address in the chat because I'm always happy to talk to people, you know, even one to one about, you know, the, the softer side of things, the soft skill side of it. Um, so if anyone ever wants insights or whatever, you're very welcome to contact me. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. thank you, ma'am. And uh, ma'am is ma'am is very active on LinkedIn. You can connect with her on LinkedIn. Yeah. You can follow her on LinkedIn. And uh, Comet Legal is a great consulting firm. I think you should follow and look for the updates. And there are good opportunities inside the company. Ma'am has already shared her email ID. Feel free to get in touch with her. And definitely, we'll be looking forward from great sessions as a mini course from ma'am because ma'am I, I think it's a great industry experience which you are sharing and I think it's very very beneficial from for students to learn because they keep on uh, sitting in a lot of interviews and coming from industry uh, as a recruiter experience it, it's, it's a helpful thing for them. Yeah sorry I would just say one more thing um I find a lot of students keep you know they go to all these webinars and talks and yes you should go to them but don't go to them if they're not useful because we all know most people who go to webinars they've just put it on the side while they're doing some something else you know if it's at the point where the talk is so boring or not useful to you it's not worth your time same with doing an internship where you're not adding value and every time you have to think about oh what is the point of actually doing this the point of doing it is to get more experience so that <laughs> you are ready for when the role the a right role comes for you um so don't also just don't waste your time <laughs> doing things which are not useful to you yeah thank you for the last uh, for the great words and a great piece of advice that for go to those webinars which are really adding value to you and uh, which doesn't which is if it's a waste of time then it's, then it's not <laughs> important but yeah attend those sessions which really see which you really see as a value addition so thank you ma'am on behalf of IAPT and thank you on the behalf of all the students Ashwarya says thank you Namita says thank you thank you so much everyone <laughs> <laughs> so we have received I think uh, from everybody who have received a thank you note for you <laughs> that's so sweet thank you everyone I really do hope it's useful and yes. yeah you're very welcome to email me. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, students. Thank you so much.